pursuit of progress. I'm Gotham Mukunda. Tonight on Greater Boston, GBH News' Philip Martin joins me on the latest updates out of Haiti. Then I'll talk to Rory Kennedy, the filmmaker behind a new HBO docuseries, The Synanon Fix. Tens of thousands of people have fled Haiti in just the past two weeks as gangs have effectively toppled the government. From aid organizations already on the ground in Haiti, it's getting harder and harder to help the Haitians left behind including for Boston-based Partners in Health and Health Equity International, based in Newton. Leaders from both groups spoke with GBH News senior investigative reporter Philip Martin, who joins me now. Philip, thanks for joining us today. No, thank you. I appreciate it. So help us understand what's happening. What caused the situation that allowed the government to fall? Well, I think we have to go back many, many years. But before we do that, I'll talk about the immediate, um, uh, the immediate, the contemporary moment. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're seeing is, you might, some might call it the logical conclusion of instability. Uh, you have gangs that have uh, that have been uh, that have emerged from uh, Haiti's chaos. Uh, st starting in really in 2010 from the earthquake, but even preceding that. But let's just say starting in 2010, when an earthquake killed uh, almost 200,000 people, it ushered in an extraordinary level of instability in the country, a country that was already facing massive uh, 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 underdevelopment, uh, and underdevelopment experience in the health sector, uh, in the uh, food sector, uh, in terms of water, in terms of uh, basic resources, this has been greatly, it was greatly exacerbated by the earthquake. Uh, and so you had successive governments that came in uh, following the earthquake. And you also had uh, groups that were challenging the police and the military. These were formal gangs, one led by a former policeman uh, who uh, has basically been waging war against uh, police and uh, the military. And what we saw after the assassination of Moise of, of last year. This is the previous president. The previous president, yeah. who was replaced by a, a, an appointed president. President um, uh, Ariel uh, Henry, and what we what we saw was a challenge to that. Um, uh, let's just say to that situation where the gangs basically uh, uh, decided they want a, a seat at the table. Two, they, appoint, they uh, opposed the notion of an appointed president or this appointed president who they saw as representing the bourgeoisie uh, in, uh, in Haiti. That term is used quite frequently. Not surprising, it's of, 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 of given its French background. Uh, and uh, so, so these gangs have essentially, they attacked the airport, they attacked the police department, they attacked all symbols of government of control in Haiti and in effect are the de facto rulers in Haiti at this point. So what are the gangs trying to gain here? What are, are there sources of revenue that they're trying to capture? What's their objective? Well, they're gangs and they're, they're criminal organizations. So what any, they are opportunistic. Uh, and, and I think, uh, but that opportunism also means that they want a seat at the table. They actually want to be a part of this coalition government that's being formed at this point. Obviously, there's the uh, intent is to create a, uh, a long-term government and the and United States States, Canada, and France are working on "quote unquote" solutions uh, to the long-term problem. In the immediate uh, sense, uh, the notion of a uh, provisional government consisting of various individuals—that's what's being uh, di uh, uh, discussed and possibly determined right now. So these gangs, they have profited from kidnapping. And so kidnapping is rampant right now. Sexual violence uh, is rampant right now throughout Haiti, but particularly in Port-au-Prince. Uh, you have some areas that are stable, quote unquote, but even those areas are contested right now. They're not controlled by the gangs, but they are contested by the gangs. We're talking about uh, uh, parts of the south uh, of Haiti, Cap Haitian, Haitian, for example, uh, and other uh, large, uh, uh, population centers. Port-au-Prince, though, is the epicenter of this instability. So, are there any government institutions left that are pushing back against the gangs, or at this point, is the Haitian government just completely non-functional? You have the semblance of a police department that's operating on the streets, but they're basically, uh, they're simply targets at this point. They're, they really don't control much. 
uh, they are they 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 try to um, protect some uh, upper class neighborhoods. But even those upper class neighborhoods, many of them have fallen victims uh, to the gangs. Heretofore, they were largely protected uh, by uh, police and the military. That seemed to be their function for many years, for decades, uh, to protect uh, those in power and so on and so forth. But that, uh, it, I, I think people are shocked at the level in the, of, of instability. Some folks uh, who have worked in Haiti for years and have worked in other uh, uh, troubled areas uh, say they've never seen anything quite like this. Um, they've juxtaposed it to uh, situations in Afghanistan uh, and even find that even there, there was a greater level of instability uh, in Kabul, for example, compared to Port-au-Prince. And where is the Haitian military in all of this? Uh, that is a great question. That is a, a great question. The, the, the military right now, I think, is, you could almost say they're waiting for orders. They don't have, there's no functioning government right now. Uh, uh, Ariel Andre, the last place he was, was uh, stuck in Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, and, and he is. Oh, I'm sorry, he's the, he's the uh, he was the provisional. Uh, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister, and I say provisional because he was largely again appointed by a committee. Ironically, that committee was uh, initially appointed by the assassinated president, uh, uh, and he then transitioned to uh, to the Prime Minister uh, Ministry. Um, and the, the the military is essentially waiting waiting and see, uh, to see what happens next, and waiting for orders uh, from their commander in chief. Right now, they don't have one, but. Uh, you could say that those who are in control right now, nominally, outs, uh, external to Haiti, again, are the United States, France, and Canada. They're trying to work out some type of, of, of deal that would restore stability in Haiti uh, and uh, also, of course, um, uh, satisfy the Haitian people. The only thing that would satisfy the Haitian people at this point, of course, is stability. Uh, right now, there, there's a food crisis. There's a, there's a, there's a, a famine is a, a great possibility in Haiti right now. And what might that deal look like? Um, it, it's a, it's, I think that deal, again, it's something that um, it's going to have to be worked out. Interestingly, they may have to involve the gangs. To some degree, because again of the control exercised by these groups. Now, the gangs themselves, this is of uh, came together as an alliance. This is unprecedented. These gangs have been fighting each other for years, uh, and and they uh, came together around an agreement to try to again force um, uh, out the. Uh, provisional president, a uh, prime minister rather, uh, Ariel Henry, and to impose themselves uh, in some form or another in the country. Well, a political scientist would say that another term for an alliance of gangs that seizes control of territory is government. So, is there is there an issue that's stopping us from from talking with the gangs and using them as sort of part of a, creating a new government, or what, what is the obstacle here? Well, these these are violent criminal groups that have killed, uh, it's still not determined how many people, but a large number. Uh, the, about 33,000 people have fled the country, uh, mainly toward the, into the Dominican Republic, but some, of course, on rickety boats heading toward Miami. Uh, and uh, you have, uh, these groups have been involved in killing people and kidnapping. So the notion of negotiating with them seems anathema uh, to, uh, to many of the negotiators. But then, like a lot of uh, negotiations that happened, like, the uh, for example, negotiating with the Taliban, uh, uh, but, but again, the Taliban was a political group, but the gangs consider themselves a political group at this point. So, in that scenario, as I should also say, what about the Dominican Republic? It shares an island with Haiti. What's its involvement in these? Hispia Nova, yes, yes, that's right. It's, uh, the, the Dominican Republic has always had a tenuous uh, and a tense relationship with Haiti. They have uh, hundreds, perhaps thousands, of soldiers on the border uh, be between Haiti and, um, and the Dominican Republic. They don't like to see, they don't want to see a lot of Haitians coming into the country and have prevented many. They've expatriated many uh, who were in D D the Dominican Republic back to Haiti. Uh, and uh, they are simply, but at this point, they do represent a source of, um, uh, a source of, of, of trans transporting food uh, and resources. Uh, and there's that attempt by Partners in Health, for example, uh, and um, Health Equity International, uh, hoping to create an air bridge uh, from the Dominican Republic to Haiti to bring in necessary food. 
So Haiti, so Dominican Republic right now is a staging area. It's a source of stability on this, uh, this contested island. Uh, and it is a, a place of refuge for some Haitians, but also, a, uh, again, a, a ongoing uh, source of tension be between the two countries. And how about these Boston-based nonprofits like Partners in Health? What are they doing and how are they involved? In They're working very hard to, uh, to, to, to do what they've always done, which is to care for the people of, uh, of Haiti, medicine. Um, obviously, they're dealing with an emergency situation right now, so they're seeing hundreds more people in the emergency rooms. Burns, burns, uh, famine, uh, hunger, um, uh, all types of problems uh, that are associated with a crisis of this sort. Uh, and, and also trying to keep the lights on, trying to keep the generators running, so they need fuel. Uh, they're trying to get their staff uh, it, it, it into these places to care for these people. And uh, many, many of these staff members are stuck in the hospital. Some of the partners in health uh, staff, they haven't been able to leave the hospital for fear of being kidnapped on the road uh, home. Uh, and the same thing is true for Health Equity International. Uh, again, working hard to keep uh, their hospital, St. Boniface, uh, open and uh, uh, and again, in the service of the Haitian people. So do they have any protection from the gangs or are they sort of in there on their own right now? Um, it's not known what, it's not clear what their security situation is. I'm going to assume, and I think it's fair to assume that they have security uh, around the hospital to protect uh, this, these infrastructures. Uh, Partners in Health has 17 facilities throughout Haiti. Uh, including a main hospital, St. Boniface, that, uh, which is run by uh, uh, Health Equity International. Uh, that is a main facility in the south. And we have to assume that they have some security protecting these structures okay. and the people who uh, operate uh, these structures, the staff. So it seems like this current crisis was triggered, at least in part, by the assassination of the former president. It, it is, but I think, again, the whole notion of instability in Haiti, it's so important uh, this current crisis was indeed precipitated uh, by uh, the assassination of the president. But when you talk about Haiti, you have to go back so many years, uh, back to, for example, 1914, when the United States essentially uh, uh, went into Haiti, uh, uh, t robbed, essentially, that's the only word you can use, took, took money from the treasury, gold, all the gold that Haiti had, took it from the treasury. So since then, Haiti has owed money to the United States and to United States corporations and has uh, and served for a long time as a piggy bank for the United States. The same thing is true with France, an agreement that was consummated in 1824, France and uh, Haiti after the overthrow of France by Toussaint Louverture. And since that time, since that time, it's Haiti that has been paying indemnities uh, to, uh, some would call it reparations, to, 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 to French, France. French. And again, this contributes to that instability. I don't think we could talk about Haiti without talking about the historic conditions that have led to its instability. So, given those sort of, the remark in particular, the remarkable scale of the reparations that France demanded for, for Haitian independence, that That's were, right. I think, a large multiple of the total Haitian GDP. Uh, precisely. Uh, is there a motivation on the part of the French government to say, at the least, we should try and stabilize the situation? There have been there have been uh, partners of Haiti uh, within the French government who have uh, essentially said that this uh, debt is uh, uh, is paid over and has been paid many times over, and that we should um, uh, extricate ourselves from uh, this situation, not from Haiti itself, but from the situation uh, that requiring Haiti to pay. Um, if you will, indemnities to, um, uh, to the French government. Well, on that note, Philip Martin, thank you so much for joining us today. I and thank you. It started out in the early 60s as an innovative addiction recovery program. But by the time it disbanded, nearly 30 years later, the group known as Synanon devolved into a violent cult accused of mental, emotional, and physical abuse orchestrated by founder Charles Diedrich. It's terrible. People suffered. People were hurt. And he did bring Synanon down around him. HBO's new docuseries, The Synanon Fix, explores the group's tragic fall from grace. Director and executive producer Rory Kennedy joins me now. Rory, thanks for being with us today. Of course. Thanks for having me. So what drew you to this remarkable story? 
Well, so Synanon was founded in uh, Santa Monica here in California, where I now live, um, in 1958 and had a fascinating start. Um, it was founded really as a the first drug treatment program in the United States at that time. There were a lot of heroin addicts in the streets of California as well as throughout the United States. And it was really becoming an epidemic, but there was no place for them to go. And there was really no sense of a solution for them. They either went to mental health hospitals or to prison or they died. Um, and Chuck Dietrich, who was the founder of Synanon, um, came from AA. He was an alcoholic and he was going to AA meetings for many years. And he was getting frustrated with AA meetings because he didn't feel like people were totally genuine when they would tell their stories. And he wanted to challenge them on their stories. So he started having these AA meetings in his storefront on Ocean Park in Santa Monica and drug addicts started coming in. And there were meetings where you could confront people and challenge them and yell at them and scream and do whatever you wanted. You couldn't be violent, but you could yell and scream. And the heroin addicts loved it. And they kept coming back and then they said, can we stay here? And he said, well, all you guys know how to do is hustle for drugs. So go hustle for some beds and some food. And and he had this storefront and people stayed there on couches. And, um, and then they moved to a, a facility called the Armory on the PCH and ultimately into what is now a five-star hotel called the Del Mar on the beachfront in Santa Monica. And it was really effective and it was it was a pioneering in its time. Um, and so kind of looking at this facility that had this background that really, you know, all of the drug treatment programs, most of the drug treatment programs we know today, like Phoenix House and um and others came from Synanon, right? So it, it has a, a very powerful, long-lasting legacy. But looking at this start of the organization and then how it evolved to what many consider to be a cult is a fascinating story. So when I watched your documentary, I think that was the thing that most struck me was most of these cults seem to start out bad and get worse. This one that's not the story. It seems to have started, at least with really good intentions, it really seems to have helped a lot of people in a profound way. And then something changed. If you were to put your finger on it, what is it that you think changed so dramatically that it went, it ended up in the place where it did? Yeah. It's hard to say that there was one moment where things changed. I mean, there were, there were certainly kind of significant shifts, but I would say in the beginning, there were really these two principles and or tenets you know, on which Synanon was founded. And one was no drugs and alcohol. And the other was no violence. And by the end, they had bought more firearms than anybody in the history of California. And they had an open bar in the facility, right? So how did they get from one extreme to the other extreme? You know, I mean, I think it's it comes down to... Chuck Dietrich, who was a very charismatic leader and um, and really drew people to follow him. It went from a place where there were not that many rules other than those two rules to a place where they started mandating behavior. And first it was innocuous. It was, you know, no, no sugar and everybody should exercise. Um, and then they started, you know, people started shaving their heads and then everybody had to shave their heads. And then, you know, it got increasingly extreme where the people were having forced abortions and forced vasectomies. Um, and, you know, there was swapping partners and there was, um, and I think a lot of the people who questioned Synanon left Synanon as these mandates became increasingly extreme. And the people who stayed didn't really have it in them to stand up to Chuck, um, who increasingly got treated like a god. So I thought sort of one of the most striking things about the documentary was the extent you were, you were able to get Chuck Diedrich's daughter to speak about what happened. 
What's that like, getting a daughter to talk about her father in, in a way that, I mean, it's certainly by the end is not in the least flattering. Well, you know, J.D. is um, is a remarkable woman. She was she was very resistant and adamant from the beginning. I started talking to J.D. probably four and a half years ago about this project. And um, she was very clear that she did not want to participate in uh, the film as an interview. And we were talking to her really about getting the archive from Synanon, which also there was a, a lot of resistance in sharing the archive from Synanon. And, and, you know, to her credit, I, I, I think that really that resistance was based on wanting to protect people who had gone to Synanon and a feeling of responsibility and, and knowing that a lot of people felt like they had been abused and had bad experiences at Synanon and she didn't want to make that any worse for anybody. Um, and at the same time, you know, I think we argue that this film could help people really understand Synanon and having that archive and allowing people to kind of really be immersed in Synanon. And so it really feels like it's a telling from the inside out. Um, we don't have a narrator in the series. It's really exclusively told from the perspective of the people who live through Synanon and have, you know, we're on the front lines of Synanon. And getting that archive in there was really important. Ultimately, she agreed and the, the Synanon Trust agreed to give us that archive. And so there's a lot of footage in here and photos and audio that's never been seen or heard before. And I think in that process, JD, the daughter, um, felt like, you know, if everybody else was sharing their stories, that it was important for her to put herself out there as well, even though she didn't want to. I mean, she genuinely, I don't think, wanted to, but she she felt like she ne needed to. And I do think her perspective is so important in helping people understand what Synanon was, what it was trying to do, um, all the good that it did. And then also, you know, she's very honest and transparent about what the cost was of Synanon and, you know, the the impact often in a very negative way it had on people's lives. So it, it seems like we talk about cults sort of more and more nowadays. You, I mean, I often hear CrossFit described as a cult. You'll see political opponents of, of Donald Trump say that the, make, the MAGA movement is a cult. Is there something you take away from this that you could learn about cults that sort of informs this the way we talk about it now? Well, I do think that there is an increased interest in cults, both people participating in cults. I've read that there are like 10,000 cults in the United States right now. It's a lot of cults. Um, and obviously there's more, um, you know, there's more series that you're, we're watching that, that have to do with cults. Um, I think from my understanding of cults that, you know, cults seem to emerge and people's interest in them are heightened when there are forces in society that make people feel like there's unrest or that they're ungrounded um, and that there's disruption. Um, and I think with everything going on today and the divisiveness and that we're seeing in our political landscape with, you know, the threat and the the worries regarding AI, um, the sense that the um, climate change is, is upon us and is wreaking havoc and kind of what's happening with our world leaders and Putin. You know, I think that people feel unsettled and in moments like this, you look at alternative leadership models. Um, so I do think understanding this history of Synanon, which takes place over largely over 20 years, 25 years, you know, over the course of four hours gives you an insight into what draws people to cults, I think. Um, and, you know, the other thing that Chuck's daughter, J.D., says, who we talked about that I think is quite insightful in terms of why people were drawn to Synanon and 
why they stayed despite everything that was happening is, you know, she says, she said, people are crushingly lonely. And I think to go into this world where you're surrounded by people, it's very vibrant, you're having these games, you're talking about your emotions, you're working through issues, you know, you don't really have to worry about your food or your or a job, you know, everything's or your housing, it's all taken care of. Insurance, they have doctors coming to Synanon, taking care of people. They had cars, they had motorcycles. Ultimately, they had airplanes and, you know, boats. Um, but things were taken care of for you. And then you had this instant community of really close what became to people, you know, they talk about it as family and and a real deep sense of friendship. So Rory, your last documentary was on the fall of Boeing and today the CEO of Boeing announced that he would be stepping down at the end of this year. Uh, I have to ask then, so what do you think of what's happening at Boeing now and what do they have to, what should they do to rescue themselves from this flat spin? Yeah, so, well, I'm glad that David Calhoun um, is is moving out and some of the other leadership is as well. I think that's a, a long time coming, frankly. Um, I do have concerns with the, um, the, the person, Stephanie Pope, who I've heard of is gonna be um, taking over in David Calhoun's place, at least for the time being. Um, because I think largely her background is in finance and money. Um, and I think that the the thing that I think the thing that Boeing needs more than anything is to focus on excellence, focus on making fantastic airplanes that are safe. And um, I think as long as Boeing continues to focus on money and finances and the bottom line. And what we document in downfall is they did that at the expense of human lives. Three, 346 people died um, in those two 737 MAX crashes. And I think that, you know, they really need somebody who is at the top of Boeing, who is an engineer, who has a background in safety, who has a commitment to excellence, and is not, you know, going to be trained in a kind of GE model of business, which is we are going to just look at our quarterly profits, and that's going to be our um, north star. And I think until they shift that. Um, and change the culture. I am not. I don't have a lot of faith when their CEOs continue to rotate. New ones come in. They tell us. They go around on the talk shows and say we're committed to safety. I don't buy it. Well, Rory Kennedy. On that note, thanks so much for joining us today. The HBO original docu series The Synanon Fix debuts next Monday, April first, on HBO and Max. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for watching. I'm Gotham Mukunda, and good night.